And I think when I started medical school, I brought those same interests to the human body where I had once, for instance, explored some natural patch of forest uh, near the medical school or just sort of with this uh, kind of inquenchable curiosity about all things. I sort of uh, used that to explore the natural world, explore all the cultures in the world that I could travel to and learn about and experience. So I sort of brought that same perspective to the human body, where the body itself was sort of the uh, geographic target of my latest exploration. And uh, that I think that perspective of the, a, a nature lover, a traveler, uh, exploring new cultures, exploring different species and how they work together in an ecosystem, those frames of uh, reference and those perspectives sort of, I think, gave me some unique insights into the human body and allowed me to connect the things I was learning with these other seemingly unconnected things across the world and uh, in human culture and human you know, habit and how we live our daily lives. And so I, I think that unique perspective might have helped contribute to this book getting written. Hello, and welcome to the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast, where you'll hear conversations that generate one aha moment after another for you. There is an enormous wave of goodness and progress well underway in the world that almost no one knows enough about yet. And yes, it is still an amazing world. On, and on this podcast, we're going to introduce you to the people making it that way. We're here to shine a light on those ingenious people, the hopeful people, the people changing our world and our futures in remarkable ways that we, are, again, we again, are not hearing nearly enough about. And I, we hope along the way, we'll inspire you to find what you are uniquely built to contribute to. Large and small, it all matters. And here's the thing, even though these thought leaders who we're talking up to, many of them are tackling some of the world's most pressing problems or trying to open up new insights that are kind of hard boulders to push again, they still think the future's bright. So we really need to know what they know. I really feel like they can teach us how to get around obstacles and turn setbacks into opportunity in our own lives. And the people that give us feedback about this podcast say that these episodes change their life every week. So we hope you'll join us every week. Today's guest is extraordinary. We have Dr. Jonathan Reisman with us. Jonathan is the author of a book called The Unseen Body a doctor's journey through hidden wonders of the human anatomy. Dr. Reisman is an author, a physician, an adventure traveler. He's also a, a huge nature lover, which we're going to tell you the story of where, where that all started. He's a forager and a foodie and a teacher of wilderness survival. He, I, this is a really, really wonderful person who has lived a life of rigorous intention and puts it all in a book where he tells um, the stories of the remarkableness of our body through metaphors and stories of his adventures with patients all over the world. That's one of the things I love most about Jonathan's uh, work is that, uh, you know, right after medical school, he headed straight to Russia. Who does that? <laughs> he's, he's, he's done med practice medicine in Alaska, in uh, the Himalayas, in Appalachia, really, really rural Appalachia. I mean, the slums um, of Calcutta. This is going to feel like a journey for all of us. I'm so glad to um, to welcome Dr. Jonathan Reisman to the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. Well, uh, Jonathan, you know, your book, um, we had a very brief chat right before we started today. And I had to share with Jonathan that his book is now every, every night and day sitting beside my bed. It's a great it's a great beside the bed read. Um, thank you for helping me end my day and sometimes start my day with, with quite a bit of wonder. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, um, I, I, um, I read a wonderful Wall Street Journal review of the book, which we'll refer to a few times in our interview. And um, that's where I got that suggestion that it might be great to just thumb through a few pages, make that sort of be my last last thoughts at night about the wonder of this vessel that that we each have. I mean, it made me kind of think of Viktor Frankl's um, notions about in the end, all we've got is our character, and that we can call our own as our character and our perspective. But I, I, you kind of made me think I can add the wonder of this vessel that I'm walking around in to that to that um, notion. So <laughs> thank you. 
Sure. It is wonderful. Okay. Yeah, I, I I just love your story. So let's let's start there a little bit. Um, tell us, give us a little snapshot of how you came to be this person that's carrying the lantern um, right now for the wonder that is the human body. Well, before I ever uh, went to medical school or wanted to be a doctor, I really fell in love with two things. One is the natural world. That was while I was in a university in, in Manhattan, of all places, where there isn't a ton of wild nature. But I managed to become interested in learning to identify all, all the kind of wild edible plants and wild edible fungi and just started studying all the animals in Central Park. Um, and got out to nature whenever I could. And I also got bitten by the travel bug. Uh, some of my first travels after college were very immersive. Um, I did go to Russia at that time and learned the language and traveled all over the country to places I'd never heard of and um, really got out of my bubble in just a, a million different ways during that trip. And I think when I started medical school, I brought those same interests to the human body where I had once for instance, explored some natural patch of forest uh, near the medical school or just sort of with this uh, kind of inquenchable curiosity about all things. I sort of uh, used that to explore the natural world, explore all the cultures in the world that I could travel to and learn about and experience. So I sort of brought that same perspective to the human body where the body itself was sort of the uh, geographic target of my latest exploration. And uh, that I think that perspective of the, a, a nature lover, a traveler, uh, exploring new cultures, exploring different species and how they work together in an ecosystem, those frames of uh, reference and those perspectives sort of, I think, gave me some unique insights into the human body and allowed me to connect the things I was learning with these other seemingly unconnected things across the world. And uh, in human culture and human, you know, habit and how we live our daily lives. And so I, I think that unique perspective might have helped contribute to this book getting written. Oh, I, I, I know it did. I mean, this is what we really are pushing for at the Goodness Exchange. Goodness Exchange is the parent um, of the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast. It's a website where people can find um, an instant access to good news about insight and innovation going uncelebrated. And the whole gist of that project is to encourage people to find what they're uniquely built to contribute. I mean, this everything that makes you up, this, this puzzle of you, brings can bring so much wonder to this little slice of our understanding about each other and ourselves. So, well, lovely. I, I, I'm, I'm totally with you. So let's give people an example of this, this connecting things that no one ever thought to connect. I have a, a host of questions here that are all about that exact thing. Do you have something right up off the top of your head that you can think of that's a good example of the kind of insights that the traveler, nature lover, doctor kind of come, come together at? Yeah, I think um, one of the ones you mentioned in our previous chat about um, the rivers and watersheds on the earth is a particularly good one. Okay, when great. I was, Go for it. Sure. When I was traveling in the Kamchatka Peninsula of Russia, when I was about, I believe I was 22 or 23 at the time. So I was very young and spent four months uh, traveling from village to village in Kamchatka. I think I went about two months without speaking any English. And um, it was really probably the most eye-opening, horizon-expanding, bubble-bursting travel I've ever done and probably will ever do, though I always am lusting after that first high, naturally, with all my travels. But um, while I was there, I was particularly fascinated with how the local people used an understanding of watersheds and streams and how they branch and connect to travel through the mountains. Particularly on a trip, I went horseback with this um, family of native Even people and uh, we, I followed them through the mountains to their hunting cabin. It was about three days of travel. We camped along the way. There was no roads. Everything was on horseback. And so one thing I learned on that trip really concretely saw was how they traveled through the mountains, how they knew which uh, mountain paths to seek out in order to get over into the next valley. We did that several times uh, on the way there and then on the way back. Under the, I could see that they understood exactly uh, how all the streams there are branching. When we started off on the first big river, 
they knew where to turn and where to turn again into smaller and smaller rivers as we traveled higher and higher into the mountains. You know, so you take the wrong branch, you end up at a, a head wall, a cliff that you just can't get over and you're stuck and have to turn around and find another way over that mountain pass. So knowing which branch to take, where to turn as the stream, you know, going, walking against the flow of the water up the streams. It's as simple as knowing which branch to follow, where to turn, and having a map of the branching network of rivers in your head, basically, was how they did that. And I found that particularly fascinating. When I got to uh, medical school, I found that actually doctors are often using the same understanding uh, to to diagnose disease and to treat it. You know, there's so many watersheds in our body because there's so many bodily fluids that flow through us and out of us. You know, for instance, the, the, the drainage of bile and uh, enzymes from the pancreas, they're sort of their own separate watersheds. Uh, juices coming from the pancreas start in these little tubules that uh, collect into bigger and bigger and become finally this final duct that will go into the small intestines and deliver the enzymes there to digest food. Similarly, from the liver, these little tiny branches of bile flowing coalesce and coalesce into the finally the common bile duct, sort of like the river, uh, the final river of a watershed. But then those two ducts connect to each other the, from the pancreas and bile flow together after that, almost like two rivers coming together, flowing to their delta at the sea. In this case, the delta is in the small intestines. Um, but the, way, the precise location where gallstones can block up that flow you can see if it's affecting both the pancreas and the liver bile system, or just one of them. Um, and so it tells you about where the confluence is, where the blockage is. You're following those branching streams in your mind to figure out exactly where that gallstone is causing problems. And then for a surgeon or gastroenterologist, when they're going after that stone, they know exactly where it is based on which organ it's affecting. Um, even a better example is in the heart where the coronary arteries branch. And when I look at an EKG, I'm almost reading the watershed of those branching arteries going to the heart. And by the alterations in electrical currents through the heart, I can tell exactly what part of the heart, which branch of the coronary arteries, which watershed of arterial blood flow is affected. And the cardiologist who's going to go in there doing a cardiac catheterization to get that uh, blood clot out, put a stent there, reestablish the flow. They know exactly where that clot's going to be uh, based on the EKG, which is almost a way of reading watersheds. So, and when they sneak that catheter up into the aorta, into the smaller branch of, let's say, the left coronary artery, then take a turn into the left anterior descending artery, and then maybe another turn into the obtuse marginal artery where the heart attacks are quite common, you're, you're turning into smaller and smaller branches in the same way that me and this family were climbing up the watershed in Kamchatka, knowing exactly where to turn in order to find either that mountain pass you know is scalable or that blood clot that's causing the heart attack and might kill the patient if you don't get it out of there soon. So in that way, um, the same knowledge of branching networks on the surface of the earth ha you know, has helped humanity throughout history. And that same knowledge goes into diagnosing and treating heart attacks and other medical problems. Okay, this is this is exactly the way of thinking that our world needs right now. People that connect things that no one ever thought to combine. Uh, and you know what? I'm a better patient for what you just said to me. You explained a gallstone, and you explained uh, my mom had was full of gallstones. So I'm probably got that gene, and my my husband recently had a heart attack. So here I here I am, a better patient. I have a better understanding of what my doctor is suggesting and how we got here and all the things for just that little, that little clip that you just shared with us. This is the way we go forward in the world. I, I can't thank you enough for sharing this, the, the, this next few minutes with us. Okay. So, so there we go. That explains uh, how understanding the mountains and the wa the way the water flows to ever smaller and smaller, if you're going up or ever larger and larger creeks going down. Um, can be used to get a proper diagnosis. That's uh, that is just super. Okay, here's another one. I'm just going to start throwing them out because you're a great Please. storyteller. Um, I uh, let's let's go to the Himalayas. By the way, Kamchatka is an amazing place. I've done a, a lot of looking at that. Can you? Oh, you're, you've got a map right behind you. Can you point to people where Kamchatka is? It's just off the the corner. Yes, all the way up here. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. Yes, way up there. It's it's. But it's the um, northeastern think, tip of Eurasia, pretty much. Don't they? Um, don't they uh, think that the largest bears in the world may be there? The, the 
Exactly. The salmon-fed coastal brown bear. I've heard that there is stiff competition between Kodiak Island in Alaska and Kamchatka Peninsula, but one of those two or both uh, have the largest brown bears in the world. Well, I tell you, um, I just had to throw that in there for the nature nerds. Um, okay, so now let's go to the Himalayas. Tell me, um, there's this great um, saying that you have that fat is not the enemy, it's the hero. And Correct. you learned that in the Himalayas. So tell right. us that, that because all of us want to know why our fat is the hero and not the enemy. Right. Well, that, that actually is in the chapter about the Alaskan Arctic. Ah, okay, uh, go for it. So, um, you know, in, I think this chapter really points out the fact that modern medicine and doctors are kind of, uh, not fully informed or sort of the nutritional science is, is still in its early stages. And a lot of advice that doctors give tends to, uh, get overturned and then overturned again and, and again. And I think a lot of people are confused, um, and their head is spinning as are ours in terms of the, the nutritional advice that doctors have given over the last few decades. I think the trip to the Arctic was particularly illustrative for me. In medical school, the nutritional education was actually quite minimal. I believe it was even something that was added to the curriculum just very recently before I had started as a med student. And a lot of the uh, nutritional science is sort of based on how fat fat in the diet is bad, especially certain kinds of fats and, and other foods are more healthy. And I think that's sort of the paradigm that nutritional science and doctors have been operating under for, for some decades. And it was kind of mentioned in passing, even in that nutrition class, that when uh, Eskimo Inuits or Inupiats, natives of the far north, uh, eat their traditional diet, which is over 50% in uh, uh, by calories based on animal fat, uh, they have actually very low cholesterol and very good metabolic health. That was sort of mentioned in passing, but it seemed like a glaring inconsistency to me. So w once I traveled to Arctic Alaska and met, uh, befriended some Inupiat uh, whale hunters in Barrow, Alaska, and went onto the ice with them to experience the spring uh, whale hunt for bowhead whales there. Uh, I think, I, and I learned a lot about their traditional diet and their still their current diet and the health aspects and found that uh, the fat that they ate in humongous quantities was very good for them. And, you know, that doesn't mean it's good for everybody because there's a lot of differences in uh, ethnicity, genetics, metabolism, et cetera, uh, nutritional science, even what's, what's the best thing to eat? That question changes not only between different ethnicities and genetic pools, but between individuals, even in the same family with the same parents. So um, it, seeing that uh, the, the diet there, the traditional diet really was probably much healthier than the current diet, which is sort of very similar to the American diet all over the country, along with a sedentary lifestyle. I think just seeing that the, the fat, the, the large quantities of, of animal fat in their diet, it, you know, showed me that fat is not the enemy, that it, that it, in the Arctic, really, it is the hero because people who evolved from, as I believe, uh, apes on the savannas of Africa could never live in the far Arctic without those huge quantities of fat. And so people would not be able to live there any other way. And so in a way, fat is the hero of that story. Without it, they could never live. Even the polar bears know to go for the fat first. Whenever you kill an animal to eat, it's always about the fat more than anything else. And so the story of the Arctic, especially humans in the Arctic, is a story of fat, this supposedly maligned dietary constituent that I learned about in medical school. So at least it showed me that the dietary and nutritional dictums that doctors are still pushing are uh, very simplified. And just the full story of human nutrition and what's best for our bodies is so complicated. And like I said, varies from in individual to individual and depends on so many factors. I think a lot of it we have not even come to even begun to understand yet. So that's a really a work in progress. Um, but it, you know, in short, fat's not the enemy. So uh, you've got to confirm or, 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 or help me improve my way of thinking on something I, I've come across many times. And um, so I have this way of thinking, and you mentioned it, about the people on the, that, that evolved on the savannas of Africa were never going to get access to the level of fat that folks in the Arctic were, you know, I, 
um, I'm a robust woman. Everybody in my family is. Um, I have friends that I could never eat like them and they remain a twig, you know? And I, what I hate in our culture now, what, that's a strong word. What I, <laughs> what bothers me in our culture now is this focus on, on some picture of fitness or health that's, that's usually going to be outside the genetic scope of almost everyone. Um, because if your people come from this place or that, they're going to, you're going to inherit some genes for survival. And that, like my dad was a physician I mentioned to you. And one of the last things he said to me before he died, he goes, Linda, you're a good keeper. You're going to have to watch your weight your whole life. And that's how, that's what he saw in his 40 years of medicine was that there are people that were just good calorie keepers. So right. talk to me about how we, uh, this is an aside, I'm sure, because, but we're going to talk about how you, and I guess it relates to this. You mentioned that most of our lives, we focus on the outside and we completely are ignorant and ignore the inside. So talk to me about genetics and, and weight before we get off that subject. Sure. I think, you know, fat, uh, we think about fat in various ways. One is the fat in our diets. Another uh, common one that probably most people think about is the fat on their bodies, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's under your skin. It's also around your organs um, in the abdomen. And there's also the fat floating in your bloodstream in the form of cholesterol and triglycerides and, and some other things. And I think the, the, how each of those relates to the other and how exactly any of them relate to what you eat is really in the infant stages of understanding. I mean, as much health advice comes out, uh, I really believe that we have so much to learn in that respect. And, you know, a full... I believe it's a full 20% of our entire genome is focused on metabolism. In other words, digesting and incorporating what we eat into our own bodies. You know, the food becomes us and that process is metabolism. And then we're maintaining and overturning and replacing all the cells in our body um, over time. That's also part of metabolism. And so a full fifth of all our genes are dedicated to that process. And so of course it's gonna be very complicated and, uh, you know, as you mentioned, even, and as I said before, even within the same family, there can be someone who has trouble losing weight, no matter what they do, and someone who has trouble gaining weight, no matter what they do. And I think that uh, it's a very complicated story, and no two human bodies have the same story about what they should eat, what will make them feel the best, what will make them the, quote, healthiest. You know, we certainly know that your appearance doesn't always correlate with your sort of internal metabolic health. Uh, the fat under your skin is not a one-to-one -one with how healthy your internal organs are or how healthy you are. So that story is um, yet to be written. I look forward to the next 50 years of research. Hopefully, we'll stop telling people to eat eggs and not eat eggs and eat eggs and not eat eggs, and people will stop thinking we're complete idiots about nutrition. We'll get there one day, I'm confident. I, <laughs> with a little luck. <laughs> yeah, with some luck. And a lot of research funding. <laughs> so, okay. So you mentioned the skin and I love a comment somewhere along the way that you make about how smart the skin is. Like this is the part of us that we do focus on. And I think we have absolutely no appreciation for the skin. Talk to us about the skin. There's a place for wonder. Right. So the skin is the, you know, it's the largest organ of the body. It's also not an internal organ. It's an external organ. So it, it covers us. Uh, protects us from the outside world. It's also how we know everybody, right? When when you see yeah. the face of someone you recognize, you're looking at only their skin, you, you, yes, and their eyeballs. But you know, sort of based on how the muscles and cartilage and fat of the face is shaped, uh, determines the shape of the face with the skin overlaying it. But what you see is really just the skin. And so when I push my hands into a patient's abdomen to feel their liver or spleen, I'm obviously, I'm not touching those organs, I'm only touching their skin. And when I listen through a stethoscope to hear their breath sounds or their heart sounds or their, uh, you know, juices being uh, moved through the gut, I'm only putting my stethoscope against skin. So it's sort of uh, how I interact with patients is mainly through the skin. How two humans interact with each other is mainly through the skin and everything else is sort of surmised about about the uh, the internal world beyond that. And there's a lot of clues, of course. I can read the skin. A lot of signs on the skin tell you about the internal uh, kind of milieu and the different organs and how they're doing and any problems that might be rising with them. 
I can tell you about the brain, you know, where in the skin you have a sense of touch and where you have some numbness, let's say, or decreased sensation can tell you about what's going on in the brain and is part of how we do a neurological exam to figure out if someone's having a stroke or where exactly that stroke might be. That goes back to the same um, watershed reasoning as where is the blood clot causing the heart attack, where is the blood clot causing the stroke is very similar. And we can sort of assess that uh, watershed to the brain of blood flow, partly through the skin and where the sensation is working and where it's not. Um, and I think, like, like you said, you brought up how skin is really smart. I think we don't, you know, give skin enough credit. It really is quite a brilliant mechanism and not just this inert wrapping that protects us in a, in a very primitive way. It's very intelligent and responds to the environment. For instance, when you're exposed to a lot of sunlight, your skin senses that and it produces pigment, uh, melanin to actually, uh, block some of the sun's rays from hitting the nucleus where you're. DNA is and where it's at risk of getting um, ionized or changed by that ionizing radiation from the sun, the UV rays. So your skin actually produces pigment to create almost like a set of sunglasses for your uh, skin cell DNA to stop some of the uh, radiation from hitting them. So it's almost anticipating future sunlight by the amount that you're getting now and responding accordingly. And in the same exact way, when your skin is experiencing friction, you know, if you start doing some new activity with your hand that involves friction in certain parts, your skin starts to thicken and form calluses uh, to anticipate more friction coming in the future and to be able to stand up to it better. So these are all adaptations of the skin that, uh, you know, respond and, and are intelligent. And even when you get a cut in your skin, you know, I, I often sew, sew cuts shut when people come into the ER almost all of them will shut on their own, even if I didn't do anything. And the cosmetic result may not be as good. There might be more of a scar, but skin is really excellent at growing in and its cells invading any defect in the skin surface, uh, invading and repopulating and covering and just reclosing that uh, inappropriate opening that got created by whatever it was, a knife, the corner of a coffee table, you know, someone's nails or whatever. Uh, the skin's really expert at regenerating itself like that. So we really are coated with this uh, quite miraculous layer that really keeps us safe in many ways. Uh, <laughs> all right. So now we know about, let's see, we're, we're on heart attacks, um, uh, gallb gallstones, suntan, because that's what you're talking about with the melanin. Correct. It's yeah, our, you, our you skin can. anticipating that if we tan today, it's because our skin is anticipating we're going to be in the sun again tomorrow. Right. So your skin gets ready for that ionizing radiation. Wow. And, and, and calluses, of course, you know, that's an anticipation. This is super. Okay. So, um, I, you know, the wonder here is what I'm so um, excited about because we, you know, these days are so complicated and the chaos is all around us in our personal lives, our working lives. It, it's amazing that we're walking around in this vessel that we have so radically ignored the wonder right in, in front of us. So let's take a break. We're going to um, introduce people to access to a, a, a great place for wonder and um, even more goodness and insight about the world. And then when we come back, we'll continue with how urine carries with it the tale of humanity's origins. <laughs> Dr. Linda here. If you are hoping the world is a lot better than what we see on the news and social media, and if you've been overwhelmed by the misery and negativity coming from the screens in your life, I've got a wonderful connection for you. What I've learned after almost a decade of curating the internet for insight and innovation is that there is an enormous wave of goodness and progress well underway in the world that almost no one knows about yet. And that's what led me to create this podcast. And then I co-founded the Goodness Exchange. The Goodness Exchange is an amazing place on the internet now where you can enjoy unlimited access to hundreds of articles that give you a more complete, positive perspective about the state of the world. You can listen to exclusive bonus content from this podcast with our guests who are knee deep in solving some of the world's most vexing problems, and yet they still think the future is bright. We need to know what they know. 
And at the Goodness Exchange, you can explore a feed of exclusively good news and recommended other kinds of content created by the Goodness Exchange community. No one with good ideas and good intentions need feel alone again. You are right to hold out hope for humanity. Millions of people are out there creating a better world, and we have created a gathering place for all that wonder. Who knows what's possible now that there's a place on the internet created to bring out our best impulses and our collective genius. To explore the home for goodness on the internet, visit goodness-exchange.com backslash membership. Thanks. Okay, we're back. So we are here with Dr. Jonathan Reisman. He is a physician, adventurer, lifelong um, person of fascination with the way things connect. Um, I think what I love so far about this conversation is how Jonathan seems to be putting together um, things that most of us would think are disparate. Um, and then there is more wonder and insight for us in our own lives too. So thank you for expanding our way of thinking about the vessel we're in and about how much there is to um, to this this life that we're leading. I, I also love the fact that I think you're making me a better patient with every word out of your mouth, out of your mouth, because I, I have, I've broken a leg recently. I've broken an arm last year and I'm, I'm appreciating the, the, the complexity of things and I'll be more patient with my healing. I think <laughs> That's what if patients good. were more patient with their healing, that, that would be a great turnaround. Okay. So let's continue. All right. So I, I gave people a little taste right before the break. Tell us how urine carries with it the tale of humanity's origins. Sure. So uh, most people probably have never thought what, what their favorite bodily fluid is. And uh, when you go to medical school, you learn about a wide variety of, of bodily fluids. You, you also learn how to interpret them. You learn how to read signs of disease and health from them. So whenever you know, a sample of some bodily fluid is sent to the lab, or even when a doctor just looks at that bodily fluid with their eyes or asks the patient about it, the color, the consistency, et cetera, uh, we're, we're gathering information, we're gathering clues, and we're sort of a bodily fluid detective, figuring out what might be going on with the body, uh, what the problem is, and, and ultimately how to treat it and improve the condition, resolve the symptoms. So bodily fluids are a crucial part of, of medicine. I'd like to say they're the medium of a physician's craft. They're what we deal with every day, nurses too, of course, and other healthcare professionals. Bodily fluids are what we deal with and the main kind of medium that we use to, to make a diagnosis and ultimately decide on a treatment. I found that urine was, was the most fascinating in many ways. It, from a very practical standpoint, it just gives you a huge amount of information about the patient's body not only about their urinary tract, where the urine is produced from the kidneys to the ureters, to the bladder, to the urethra, and then out of the body. Of course, it gives you an enormous amount of information about the, that tract and those uh, organs and parts of the tract, but it also, urine tells messages about all the other organs that you wouldn't really expect. For instance, in diabetes, when someone's pancreas is, is failing, uh, you uh, you see re the results of that in the urine itself. The, the urine starts showing sugar in it, even though you wouldn't think the pancreas and the kidney have any particular relationship to each other. The kidneys have this sort of all-seeing quality where and they sort of oversee all the other organs and, and put clues to their misbehaving or uh, you know misfunct dysfunctions in the urine. Beyond that, however, uh, the way when we're sick, the way our kidneys and urine respond was particularly interesting to me and did reveal sort of the story about, um, about our history and our ancestors. So when we get sick, let's say we're not drinking as much fluid or not staying as hydrated, we're losing more water from the body to the environment through fever, through sweating, um, through just the illness itself, revving up our heart and lungs and bodily systems that uses more water and releases more water to the environment. So dehydration is a big part of sickness. And what the kidneys do smartly when you're not taking in as much water and you're, le you're losing more water to the environment, the kidneys slow down the, the urine faucet, basically. They let less urine and electrolytes and salts leave the body so that we can maintain it uh, in ourselves so that there's enough 
liquid, enough bodily fluid to flow and bring oxygen to all our organs and keep everything healthy. Uh, so that, that the, the kidneys are very expert at dialing up or down the amount of fluid that leaves their bodies through the urine and also the amount of electrolytes and salts, sodium, chloride, potassium, and others. I mean, it works over time to do that in illness. And basically, when you learn all about the details of the kidney, you learn about how it maintains uh, salts at a certain level. It maintains sodium and chloride, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and there's a, whole, a long list. It keeps it within very narrow windows of concentration in the bloodstream. And when you're sick, it works harder over time to do that. And basically, what it's trying to do is keep your, uh, your blood within these certain narrow windows of electrolyte concentrations that basically match o ocean water. So we have in our blood, we have about the same amount of sodium chloride, which are both high in our blood as they are in the ocean. At the same time, our blood is low in potassium, just like ocean water and various other electrolytes are similar in concentration. And this just tells the story that we sort of evolved in the ocean. And the only reason we were, our ancestors were able to take up life on land, which is sort of governed by fresh water, not salt water. And we're able to still survive, even though we drink fresh water with no salt in it. We bathe with fresh water, no salt. We water our crops with fresh water with no salt. We are still these salty creatures from the ocean. And the only reason we can live on land and not have that salt all washed away by what we drink is because the kidneys are there tinkering with it, controlling the amount of salt and water that we release to the environment, and basically keeping our blood within these narrow windows, as I call it, it's our ancestral brine, and it must be just salty enough and not too salty. And so the kidneys are kind of the master at that. And uh, the urine is the result that helps keeps everything in balance. Oh, that is such a lovely um, way of appreciating uh, um, the, our connections to our earliest beginnings, too. That's like, it's like we're carrying our own little ocean with us. Yeah, exactly. We all have our own personal little ocean inside of us and the, you know, the flow of urine helps it stay that way. Wow. Okay. So I got to just ask some practical points on that topic. So my, I have a 22 year old son and he's, you know, six at six, constantly walking around, trying to be healthy, does his own cooking and all that. And um, he is carrying around a gallon container of water at all times. That kid drinks so much water. It's not even fun. And me, I'm the cactus of the family. I am, I feel like I'm constantly dehydrated, but I'm just uh, not focusing enough on that. Okay. So between there is probably the way, the, the way forward, but tell us how we, um, is it true that when you look at your urine, um, if it's really, really dark yellow or bright yellow, that that's an indication that it's way too, um, it's not dilute enough. It's just got too much stuff in it. And that's dehydration. Is that, is there any, anything you want to share with us about how to, you know, keep ourselves healthy there? Sure. I, I do think that most people probably would be fine if they did not hydrate as much as they are. Um, that being said, you know, you can drink too much water at one extreme. I mean, it takes, you know, 10 to 12 liters or something to really lower the sodium in your blood um, and you'll be urinating all day. But um, so at the extremes of not drinking anything or drinking 10 liters a day, you know, the, neither of those are good. The, the thing is the kidney is quite good at compensating. So if you don't drink a lot of water for a few days, your kidney adjusts itself to be better at getting rid of, of salt without releasing as much water. Mm -hmm. And if you do drink a lot of water for a few days, let's say your kidney gets a little bit washed out and not as good at handling a dehydrated state. So it sort of, to some extent, it depends on the individual person and what they've been doing recently and therefore what their kidney is ready for. So even from the moment to moment titrations of salt and water, the kidney does get affected over time. Um, and you know, if you don't, if you're a person who doesn't hydrate much, your kidneys probably are compensating and able to deal with it. That being said, there's people with medical conditions who should hydrate more people who tend to form kidney stones. You know, you want that calcium and phosphate, et cetera more dilute so that crystals don't form in your urine, um, et cetera. There's always particular cases. Uh, and, you know, dehydration in illness is sort of different than just dehydration in, in every day. Uh, you know, if someone's dehydrated because they're vomiting and having terrible diarrhea and just can't keep up with the losses, 
you know, that's a, that's sort of a more serious situation. And sometimes they need IV fluids or if someone has like a overwhelming infection, like sepsis, sometimes we'll give them four or more liters of fluid through their, um, IV, uh, because they're in, they're in sort of a very, a special kind of dehydrated state where not only are they not drinking a lot, but their body is sort of uh, reacting to this infection in an overwhelming way that requires a lot more volume of fluid. But, um, so in short, it's different for every person, but I do think that our kidneys are very, you know, as long as our kidneys are healthy, our kidneys are very good at managing whatever we eat and drink within reason when not going to extreme. So I would say everyone should not worry too much about hydration. All right, great. Because we do worry a lot about it. We do. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. And um, uh, I've got a little side side. I'm, I'm just desperate to go down on this issue, but we got to keep moving on. Okay. So I love your concepts about the the boundary of where the brain ends and where the mind begins. Let's talk about that. Sure. So I talk about the brain and the mind in the, the chapter on the brain where I go to uh, Nepal and work in a high altitude clinic there treating trekkers who are trying to get over the mountains and locals as well, as well as porters and guides who are helping the trekkers. Uh, it was a very special area because there's a lot of uh, lamaseries and monasteries where Tibetan Buddhist lamas hang out, live, meditate, and also a lot of pilgrimage sites in the valley, very high altitude caves and shrines that people are coming from far away to, to visit and pray before. Um, so it was a very special place. And among the locals that we got to treat in that clinic were some uh, Tibetan Buddhist lamas, in particular, one lady who had lived in a cave up the hill from the clinic for about 30 years, more than 30 years uh, by herself. And she spends about most of her waking hours meditating when pesky tourists are not there disturbing her and wanting to see her cave, which is actually a very comfortable um, and cute little <laughs> well-decorated place uh, for her to live. I was surprised to see. It was quite, quite impressive. I think that it was fitting that, you know, when you go to the mountains, oftentimes people are sort of pondering their daily life. The mountains are a way that you're getting away from daily life. You know, you're going up physically in altitude, you're going up when you go into the mountains, you're also going far away from what you know, far away from your home, your daily life, the stresses of your daily life. And so the physical removal of going up and far away into the mountains is analogous to getting away metaphorically from your daily life to get a new perspective, literally from above, uh, to, to see, you know, reflect on things in your life. So I see the kind of the brain and the mind have this similar pattern where the brain, air, the brain is sort of, you know, the physical manifestation, the, in particular, the lowest level of the brain, the brain stem controls our breathing and heart rate and influences digestion and our sweating and uh, blood pressure, etc. It's very focused on the robotic aspects of the human body, almost sort of, you know, if we have an angelic and an animalistic nature, the brain stems all about the animal side of our, of our bodies and ourselves connecting just sort of the algorithms of keeping the body ticking as if it was a complicated mechanism. And as you go higher and higher in the brain, you get to more complicated functions and more complicated uh, areas of the brain, things that we tend to more recognize as part of the mind or part of the subjective experience that we all have of being in our bodies and inhabiting our brains. So you get from the brain stem up into the emotional centers where you start to see these hints of personality and how everyone's unique. And then you get even higher up into the cerebral cortex, the cognition centers where we have executive function and problem solving and analysis, the part that we covet the most because we're, you know, kind of mind loving creatures who think our own minds are the greatest thing the universe ever created. Um, though I actually think the immune system is pretty amazing too, and, and might even give the human mind a run for its money in, turn, in terms of the most amazing thing to come out of this universe. But, and I think that going, you know, you're, you're going up in altitude when you go to the mountains, especially high ones. And, and as you go from the brainstem through the emotional centers into the cerebral cortex, you're also going up in altitude in a way, if you're standing upright, you're going up to higher levels of the brain, almost as if someone were going up to higher levels in the mountains to be more secluded, more reflective, to visit some of these 
shrines that are in the rarefied air of high altitude where you can hardly breathe. And maybe some of that punishment of the thin air is part of the spiritual experience. I'm not sure. Um, so I think, you know, where does the brain end and the mind begin is a little bit of a tongue in cheek question because I'm, I don't really believe there's a line there, but it's sort of this, you know, the last several thousand years of philosophy and even before that is sort of to figure out where does the brain end and the mind begin. And I'm open to many explanations. I don't have the answer myself. I do think that probably there is no line, but as you take steps higher and higher into the central nervous system or higher and higher into the mountains, you kind of get closer perhaps to that angelic side of the human being, to that uh, mind from which sort of you can look down on the body from a, from a distance. I, I, you know, there's that, there's that term, um, you know, when someone's very cerebral, we say. Right. <laughs> right. That, that's probably what that's referring to, right? <laughs> They're the kind that you would find in a cave in the highest parts of the Himalayas. Right working on the highest parts of their brain. Now, you know, um, we're, 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 we're very close to something that a lot of us um, care about these days. Uh, so we might as well stay with the brain for a few minutes. You know, there was this notion until very, very recently, I have a little side hobby. I love to read neuroscience and, you know, Oliver Sacks and the man who mistook his wife for a hat rack, wow. all that stuff. And, um, you know, the, this, this notion of neuroplasticity, that um, for so long, we just thought that it was a constant downhill uh, go of it um, as you got, as you age uh, in our brains. But that's, that's, how does a uh, neuroplasticity kind of factor in to the wonder that you find in the brain and that you've seen all over the planet? Sure. Uh, you know, I'm not an expert in this, and this is definitely a very uh, uh, fast changing area of science for sure. But it's definitely true that uh, what we saw as static, what we, I, I believe we assumed that the brain, you know, you're born with all your brain cells uh, from birth, and then that's kind of it. But it seems uh, sort of rather obvious that the brain can be plastic and compensate, especially in people, like I see people with strokes, um, strokes the si uh, a, of a size where you would not expect them to regain any of a particular kind of function, and they do. Or even a lot of, I've seen a lot of patients, pediatric patients who are born with uh, very impressive deformities in the brain. So for instance, when you do a CAT scan, you just see a very abnormal brain and you're, it's shocked, shocked, sometimes shocking it's even compatible with life. And then you go into the patient's room and the kid looks absolutely like a normal child, talking, playing, looking at you, moving all parts of the body. Uh, in a similar way, I've actually had some people where, you know, there's a lot of people out there walking around with a huge cyst in their brain that they don't know about, an arachnoid cyst that they were born with and that grew. And I've seen people with humongous cysts taken over more than half of all space within the skull. And they're absolutely normal. And there's no sign that their brain is being smushed. Because it happened slowly over time, the brain was able to con uh, compensate. If that same cyst size appeared over a minute, that per there is a zero percent chance anyone could survive that. But when it happens over years and decades, the brain uh, compensates, is plastic, and can really pick up the slack in very surprising ways. So I'm not shocked at all to hear that the brain is not static and that it is plastic. You know, I think that relates to an article I wrote a couple of years ago um, about the 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 kind of new mindset about. Um, Asperger's autism and all that. There's a, there's a wonderful story of a car wash called the autism car wash in Florida, Parkland, Florida, I think, um, if I remember right, where um, it was a nice, nice family with two son, two sons and they, they had a <clears throat> son that was severely autistic. And um, they found that he was just the best, most meticulous fellow when you put him in front of cleaning a car. And um, I think of the 42 employees, 40 are on the spectrum somehow. Everybody's oh, wow. having a good life. They're making a living. They're contributing. They're, the family has a way that, 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 that the, the other brother um, can engage in a wonderful way. And That's great. Now, then I think that I think I read something in the New York Times not that long ago about one of the largest accounting firms in the world has changed their hiring process. So what they figured out was there's a lot of people on the Asperger spectrum that would make amazing number crunchers for a whole uh -huh. lot of reasons. Um, but that the interview process was sort of favoring people who you'd like to go out to dinner with. 
And when they created a different interview process, it, it, it just advances this every brain is beautiful concept. Like, I think that's that's what you're what you're pointing to too is that the the human mind is an our brain is an amazing mechanism that will will um will create um I don't even know what word I want here will create opportunity and and try and make the body work last function without a hiccup if it can and um I I I love that about anything that we point to that's advancing our ways of thinking about how each other thinks. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, everyone is unique. Our brains are all very unique. So our livers, spleens, kidneys, and heart, no, no two anythings are the same. Even someone's left lung and right lung are very different shaped. Um, so I think the brain too, it's just, I think the brain is, you know, the least understood organ and we're the, the slowest to sort of see all of its peculiarities or at least to appreciate them and to see how everyone is different. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So let's shift gears and go to this other great thing I had to ask you about. <laughs> how about how eating sheep's head in, in Iceland can offer lessons about empathy? Sure. So in the great tradition of my book of connecting totally uh, different and surprising things, you know, I bring food into the equation, which... You would think that going to medical school, in particular dissecting a cadaver, would uh, not make one hungry, but rather would utterly demolish your appetite. And that's true. However, I did uh, become interested in food through dissecting the cadaver. Actually, we, we had a professor who enjoyed pointing out which muscles in the cadavers that we were studying and having to learn uh, corresponded to which cuts of from a from a from cattle. So for instance, the muscle called the psoas major is the filet mignon and, uh, you know, other muscles in the back of the thigh that we were studying in our cadavers, uh, constitute the top round and the bottom round and the eye of round and everything from the flat iron steak to, uh, you know, the ribeye steak and everything in between. So I got very interested with that and I, I, that sort of set me off on a, a, a food related discovery odyssey that I'm still on and probably will be still on forever. But I got interested in kind of knowing about butchering. I learned to butcher at that time. I, I got very interested in cuts of meat and how the muscles in us and how they function in our daily lives and the corresponding muscles and animals function in their daily lives and how, how that becomes our food basically, you know, in in medical school, you learn about what the body is made of in a million different ways. But one way to summarize it is that we're made of food um, as our animals that we eat. And so it went beyond just muscles into offal and internal organs. And I got a new appreciation for liver, which I had never enjoyed as a kid. But once I learned all about the liver and what a fascinating organ it is and how much it does for us to keep things in balance, uh, I... I became fascinated with it and wanted to try it again just because it was incredible to me that this huge brown glistening chunk of flesh that keeps us alive in a million different ways from minute to minute after death can become chopped liver literally uh, which is how it was served in my family and so I, I did grow to like it and i tried a variety of other organs and unusual body parts and i really enjoy seeing how knowledge of uh, and experience with anatomy and physiology can translate into understanding our food and where it comes from better and using the entire animal and not throwing away a single uh part of it or organ not only because it's more sustainable but also because it's fascinating and it's delicious um so um Sheep's head right. in Iceland. <laughs> yes, exactly. So <laughs> how do we get here from a sheep's head? So in the book, I talk actually in the liver chapter where I, I tell that story about how I, uh, through my fascination with human body, physiology, biochemistry, came to enjoy eating chopped liver. I talk about the most anatomical meal of my life, which was in Iceland where I went for my honeymoon. One of my wife's uh, friend's uh, relatives served me a traditional dish called svid, Many cultures have traditions and recipes of eating animal heads, and this was one where the head was uh, split from front to back, kind of right down the middle. And you could see, you know, the cross section of that head as it appeared on my dinner plate was just like these cross sections in my anatomy textbook that I had memorized painstakingly for, for the exam. In fact, 
the exam for the head and neck was one of the hardest exams because there's just so much going on in the head and neck. It's very busy real estate. So seeing all those structures that I memorized in my anatomy textbook that I saw in my cadaver that I know are inside my own face and that are in the faces of every person I've ever met or known or loved or been friends with or treated as a patient, uh, seeing it there on the plate was sort of a, a sledgehammer of uh, you know recognition that that we are the, that we're made of the same stuff as these animals, and that everything you've lived, everything that you experience in your life, every sensory input that's hit your eyes and been transmitted backwards to your brain, every smell and taste and everything you've heard, that's uh, the information from which has coursed through these nerves that sort of uh, are behind our faces that connect our sensory organs to the brain. All that information, you know, everything we love about life, everything we touch and see can be reduced to food basically after you're dead as it did for this sheep that I was eating. And, you know, that's okay. The death that I treat in patients or try to prevent or try to, um, you know, make easier sometimes is the same death that uh, these animals go through before we eat them. I mean, I'm a human, so naturally I'm biased. I think human death is worse, is the worst death, uh, naturally. But, um, you know, seeing the similarities and understanding what we're made of, I think, gave me a good appreciation for what's in our food, where it comes from, and how life can turn into food kind of as part of the unending cycle that we're part of. All right. So I, I, um, I have to ask if we're there um, about how, how you've seen um, cultures um, and food uh, inform this, this part of your journey, because there's so much in your journey about food going on right now. Like, I think you're headed to Mississippi for a food event. I mean, you've become like a real foodie. Yeah. The food, um, I am sort of building that food aspect of my, uh, my interests. So I started, uh, I'm co-creator of a food series here in Philadelphia called Anatomy Eats, where I joined up with chef Ari Miller to serve a bunch of dinners based on bodily systems. We did a cardiovascular dinner, a digestive system dinner, a musculoskeletal system dinner. Um, I'm taking the show on the road though to travel across the country and meet up with local chefs to serve, uh, to hold dinners and serve OFL and other unusual body parts to talk about anatomy and physiology. All of it's delicious, of course. I'm not, I'm not suggesting anyone eat something gross or unpleasant just so that we're not wasting uh, parts of animals that we kill, though that's a side benefit. But I'm saying this food is both fascinating and delicious. And, uh, and side benefit, it's much you know, sustainable if we use every part, not to mention if we're going to kill animals to eat them, it really, you know, sort of the human, humanistic thing to do, just, just use every part. But uh, so on October 2nd and 3rd of this year, I will be in Oxford, Mississippi, joining up with uh, two local chefs to serve an incredible dinner. The menu includes heart tacos and bone marrow ice cream. So we'll be talking all about those and other body parts too. And uh, it's going to be amazing if anyone's in the area. Okay. So I love, I, I, so, so this is the way the future, this is what the future holds for us. This last little part of our chat, um, Jonathan, is why I started the Goodness Exchange, why we do the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast, because the future is so bright if it's full and it is full of people like you who take, take us from here to here. That you know, these this is a leap. So just to make sure everybody can can connect with this, it's called. I have it in my show notes here. Um, you're the co-creator of the anatomy and physiology based dinner series called Anatomy Eats. Correct. Yeah. And people find that online. Yep, anatomyeats.com. You'll find us. Okay. Then you're writing once in a while for the New York Times, Washington Post, etc. Right. Correct. Yep. Discover Magazine too. One of my favorites. Yeah. Everything's there on my website, also jonathanreisman.com, links to Anatomy Eats and other events that are coming up. Okay, and don't worry, um, we're going to have all this in the show notes. We're good about show notes um, and the thoroughness of how we want you to, what we want you to do next to connect with Jonathan and continue this journey. Um, you also have uh, a nonprofit called the World Health and Ed Education Network, or another name for it is the Calcutta Rescue USA. Tell, tell us about that before we sign off. 
Sure. So uh, when I was a medical student, I spent a bunch of time in India volunteering for uh, this charity called Calcutta Rescue, which is based in Calcutta, India. And I was really blown away in a million different ways by how effective they are and efficient and the high quality of medical care and education they're providing to a population really of the poorest people, some of the poorest people on earth, certainly the poorest people I've uh, ever interacted with, people living on the streets and in the slums of Calcutta, especially, and uh, providing really evidence based, up to date uh, standards of care. Uh, I was very impressed as a medical student. Calcutta India has so many different charities, it's hard to count. And I found that Calcutta Rescue really stood out in the quality of of healthcare is providing and also provides education, has a bunch of other projects and it's grown from the late seventies when it was started by a British physician to a quite a large uh, nonprofit, almost a self-standing healthcare system in itself um, in Calcutta. And so, so I uh, started a support group for them when I got home, that was in 2009. And we've been growing slowly ever since and uh, since I've been there myself and seen what they do with my own eyes, I really, really believe in their mission. And I really know that every dollar is being spent well. And so, um, so I put some of my time towards that very worthy effort. Lovely. And, you know, in this time when, you know, we don't know who to trust, we've got so many demands on our attention. And, and certainly there's so many places that we could all turn to give back the good fortune we found. I love that you're that you're mentioning to us that you know this organization well and and you can speak for their integrity and and I hope people will go there. We'll put a reference to that in the show notes as well. Great. So and um let me just add have, that we I just wanted ahead, to add please. we don't take any money out of donations for overhead a hundred percent of every donation ends up in Calcutta. Wow. Um, and then, of course, people uh, will probably ask, oh, then what pays the bills and probably sponsorship? Yeah, well, we don't have many bills. You know, we're a kind of a nonprofit here in the U.S. And uh, we just, our board, our board of directors just donates us some of our time and money to promote and get the word out and, you know, be a sort of a funnel for Lovely. money to Calcutta Rescue and a few other smaller charities in Nepal and India. But all of which I've been there on the ground and seen seen what they do and, and have full trust in, in where how far your dollar can go in those places to really help some very poor people. Well, it's great to wrap up on, on a level of kindness like that. I can't thank you enough, Jonathan. Um, again, the book is The Unseen Body, A Doctor's Journey Through the Hidden Wonders of the Human Anatomy. Um, if you want to check out the New York, the Wall Street Journal's um, uh, great um, review of the book. There's some great little highlights in there that you'll recognize from the show. And uh, it's just it's just really a treat. And thank you so much for joining us on The Conspiracy of Goodness. You are certainly a podcast. You are certainly a leader in the, in our, the conspiracy of goodness of our times. Thank you so much for having me, Linda. Okay, well, um, you know, everything about we, that we talked about will be in the show notes. You know, remember to, to take a look at the Goodness Exchange. Um, the Goodness Exchange solves this problem of how we know about a world full of Jonathan Reismans, a world full of people that are tackling some of the most important problems and making headway. We, I don't know about you, Jonathan, but I. so many people today remark to me that they've turned off the news entirely. And of course, if we do that, we miss that one out of 20 story that, that might be about the goodness happening in the world. So if people want to connect with that, the Goodness Exchange is a source for um, instant access to the other story that's not being told nearly enough about humanity and our future. We hope that all the connections to goodness and progress that Jonathan and I talked about carry you through your week and you start finding all the joy and wonder that we've been talking about. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you so much.